can I just welcome everybody um, to the day two of our Edinburgh Business Festival and uh, this morning's panel session is the future of live events. Um, I believe um, this is the this has the highest number of bookings of, of all the sessions for the week. So that either says something about the importance of this topic uh, to people of Edinburgh or our um, star studded panel and, and speakers that we've got lined up for you. Um, really, really a good group of people. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, I've got the very easy task of just welcoming you and introducing our chair for the session, uh, Susan Deacon, then I can relax um, and enjoy the discussion myself. Susan um, probably knows uh, more than anyone um, the, the devastation that's been caused to our festivals and live events sector um, by the by the pandemic. Um, she chairs the Festivals Forum, which is a group of key stakeholders in the city um, that takes an overview of the strategy and ensures that the festivals continue to evolve. Um, so we've been um, you know, really uh, engaged in what's been happening as, as the festivals have been uh, facing into this challenging 12 months. Um, with spring here and um, you know the summer on the horizon, uh, the lead time for planning these kind of events is really running out. Um, there's going to be a go no go date very very soon, um, and unfortunately, um, there are things beyond the control of our event organisers that need to be in place um, to to ensure that the show goes on. Um, we really need, in my view, to find every reason possible, every way possible to get our festivals and live events back and not try to find reasons why they shouldn't go ahead. Um, the economy of Edinburgh is so symbiotically connected and linked to the festivals and our live events. I don't think we could even imagine an Edinburgh without these. Um, it's absolutely critical. Before I hand over to our chair, Susan Deacon, um, can I remind you that we do have a keynote session this afternoon. Um, we have Graeme Farrington, who's MD of UK and Ireland for um, Innocent, which is the smoothie company. Um, I met him uh, just last week. I think it's going to be a great session, so please um, join us for that. I would also like to say thank you to our sponsors um, who've made this possible. Thank you very much to Hee Haw and your GB. As always, you know, it's the generosity of our members in the private sector that steps up to ensure that uh, these kind of events can go ahead. So if I can just uh, introduce our chair, um, Susan Deacon. I've known Susan for some time, so thank you very much for, for joining us, Susan. I think it's fair to say Susan's had a life of public service uh, with leadership um, roles across public, private sector, third sector, academia and politics, um, a real polymath um, and we're delighted to uh, you joining us this morning. Um, interesting, Susan was a Labour M MSP, but she also served as Scotland's first cabinet minister for health and community care um, when um, Scottish Parliament was first established in 1999. So um, thank you very much, a great supporter of the chamber. So that's me. Um, I'm going to hand over to Susan and um, look forward to a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Liz, and, and for that very nice introduction. And can I just on behalf of I think so many of us say a huge thank you to you and everyone at the chamber, both for this event, but also everything that you've been doing over the last year to keep us all connected and to make sure that um, businesses and organisations across the city are supported and informed and it's been just so important so it's lovely to work with you and everyone at the chamber. Um, I also wanted to say a huge welcome to I know the vast array of people who are taking part in this session today. It would be so fantastic if we were all mixing and mingling in the ICC over a cup of tea or coffee and having a chat about work, life and the events that we've been to or that we're planning to go to over the summer and sadly that's just not where it's at just now but the whole purpose of today's event, uh, today's event is to think about how and when we can come together again in live events and 
you don't need me to tell you that Scotland as a country has punched above its weight in the world in terms of our events industry and nowhere more so than in our wonderful capital city of Edinburgh and I'm delighted that we have a panel today that has absolutely walked the walk um, of the last year and are looking ahead now to where we go in 21 and beyond and we'll hear from each of them in just a moment. The format for the session is that each of the four panellists will speak for about five minutes and then we'll go into discussion led by me, but there is, as ever, a chat function, um, which I would encourage you to be uh, thinking about what you'd like to raise with the panellists. Um, and I will do my best to follow that as well as follow the discussion and try and make sure that your questions are raised. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, the first of our panellists this morning. Um, Marshall Dallas is the director of the Edinburgh International Conference Centre. He has a long and accomplished career in the leisure and hospitality sector. I decided incidentally today not to give you full biogs of our speakers, so we'd have no time for discussion. Um, but as many of you will know, Marshall has been in his role at the ICC since 2014, and I think it's fair to say that he really has taken um, the ICC to another level, and it now has a newly developed mission, which is, and I quote, to create an environment which inspires ideas that change the world. Now, of course, at the moment, the ICC, like so many major venues, is a vaccination centre, but we hope that the work it's doing now is precisely the kind of work that's going to let it get back to business in the near future. So, Marshall, thanks so much for joining us today, and please share with us your thoughts for the future of live events. Well, thank you, Susan. And um, we absolutely would love to have everybody here mixing and mingling at EICC too, but it's just not going to happen for the foreseeable, un unfortunately. Um, so um, just as a brief introduction, I just I, I thought I'd just give you a, a, a quick synopsis of uh, um, my experience, but also where we are currently as a, more importantly, where we are currently as a, as, as a business. Um, my name is Marshall Dallas. I'm chief executive at EICC. I've, um, I've had 25 years experience within the hospitality industry at all levels from uh, barman to CEO, which is my current title at the moment. Um, all of, I've worked in hotels all over the world. Um, and I've also had a, 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 a short five year stint in private healthcare also as a director for um, a, a private healthcare organization. But for the last six years, I've, I've had the privilege of leading um, a team of what I think are the, some of the world's best operators um, uh, within our industry. And I'm, I'm delighted to be at the helm of that. Um, and up until 2020, we had recorded five record years for the ICC, both in economic impact into the city, that's delivering over £50 million a year into the city, with, uh, but also delivering over a quarter of a million room nights into the city from delegates who stay at EICC. And we were expecting to do uh, our, our sixth uh, record year, but um, then COVID happened. And since March the 18th, uh, we closed our doors to live events and we haven't put on a live event ever since. Um, having said that, we, we had discussions with Napier University and we, uh, we managed to strike a deal with them uh, to, uh, to turn EICC into an extension of their campus um, for their business students. Um, so for their first semester, semester, they utilized EICC's facilities um, for face-to-face -face learning. Um, we then struck a deal with uh, the NHS and in January, uh, just January there, January the 14th, we signed a six-month contract with the NHS to provide um, uh, EICC's facilities again as a, as a vaccination center. And indeed, we are Edinburgh's uh, principal vac vaccination center. Uh, delivering up to 28 to 30,000 vaccines a week. Um, but in addition to that, we've um, 
we've had to do our day job and it's been fascinating. Um, painful, but fascinating also, because we've had to, we contacted over uh, about 300 different international associations to try and renegotiate their, their terms with us. And, and that meant, in some ways, that meant that we had to cancel some events. But I'm pleased to say that because of the, the skill and experience um, of our sales and marketing team, we managed to um, reschedule their events to either further on this year or, or, or into 2022 and beyond. And I've got to say the team have done a fantastic job because we've, we've not only protected our relationships with the vast majority of our clients, but we've also um, managed to uh, create and generate significant amounts of revenue this year, which has really ensured that, um, that our, uh, our, our team remain in employment. So I'm very proud to say that uh, because of that, we've, and many other things that we've done there, we've managed to, to get through this period so far without any redundancies. Um, so the, 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 the day job has been extremely challenging for all people that are working at EICC. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to say that we are, we are uh, not only protecting the business that we've got, but we've also um, secured in excess of about six and a half million pounds worth of conference and events business between 2021 and 2028. So I'm, you know, it's great to see that the pipeline, although it's been a, a really challenging short term year, the pipeline is still robust. It's still strong at EICC. Uh, and that gives us great encouragement for the future. And finally, Susan, w w one of the other things that, that, that I've been doing this year is um, some may or may not be aware that uh, EICC is um, about to uh, embark on a new project, which is the building and operating of a 362 bedroom hotel. And in addition to that, we are creating and building a hotel school, a hospitality school that will run concurrently alongside that. So we've been quite busy this year. Um, thanks. That's that's uh, that's my introduction. Thanks very much indeed, Marshall. I, I feel that saying you've been quite busy this year is probably the understatement of the same. <laughs> Um, and I think what you've shared with us there, that picture of how you've had to, as you say, do the day job and also adapt and innovate at scale and be creative about what you do in the ICC is, is just a, a model, really, of um, Thank you. What, what, what has had to be done in the sector. And that's fantastic to hear your positive outlook for the future. We'll come back to many of these thoughts, I'm sure, um, in the discussion. Um, but next, let me move on to our next speaker. Um, again, I'm so conscious that all our speakers today, particularly for, for a largely Edinburgh audience, you know, need very little introduction, but I will do a little one anyway. So Shona is the Chief Executive of the Edinburgh Festival Fringe Society, which is, I'm sure you'll know, is the body that essentially underpins the world's leading open access performing arts festival, one which is absolutely known quite literally across the world. Shona has been in that position since 2016, but she has, although you wouldn't think to look at her, but she has almost 30 years of senior leadership experience covering all sorts of areas of events, including leading on Derry, London Derry's transformational year as the city of culture. And again, I know that over this past year, um, Shona, while more gutted probably <laughs> than most at uh, the cancellation of our summer festivals in their normal form was again absolutely at the forefront of flexing and adapting and innovating and is now looking to the future too. So Shona, we really look forward to hearing from you. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, Susan, and great to hear um, what Marshall had to say there and to see what the ICC have managed to do under such strange circumstances. Um, Susan, I just want to I want to set out a picture of tw what 2019 looked like in the first place, um, just to give a sense of uh, of what we lost. Um, so in 2019, the Edinburgh Fringe, quite literally the biggest performing arts festival in the world, as Susan said, um, we had over 4,000 shows in 320 venues across the city. Uh, we sold over 3 million tickets, and that doesn't even account for all of the people who went to the free fringe shows as well. 
uh, and we had over 56 countries represented on the stages of the fringe. Um, we know that the social, cultural and economic impact of the festival um, is massive, massive for Edinburgh, massive for Scotland, massive for the UK. It's been estimated in, uh, in all kinds of ways from 200 million um, per year back into the economy, right up to a piece the Times did uh, in 2019 that estimated it was closer to a billion. Um, so it's, it's, it's crucial to the city in terms of economics, in terms of um, its um, support for the cultural practitioners and creatives across Edinburgh and Scotland. In 2019, we had 900 shows from Scotland alone. Uh, and the platform that it creates for, um, for artists and performers and new writers and emerging talent to be able to have their work seen from the curators and programmers who arrive from across the world to find and select work for their own festivals and theater uh, and theaters from the fringe indeed we have uh, phoebe wallerbridge just signed up to be our new president of the fringe society um which is which is wonderful because she herself um had her starting point with her famous now infamous show fleabag at the fringe and just brilliant to have someone like her as a as a new champion to help take us into the next phase. So for this extraordinary festival um, in March of last year, we were all set for another phenomenal year of the Fringe in Edinburgh. And then COVID struck and like everyone else, um, Whew, uh, what a shock at first we you know we kind of limped into thinking well you know it might last for a month or two and we'll be we'll be up and running for August and um, I don't think anybody at that stage could have foreseen just the impact that this would have had um, it became quite clear with ourselves and our sister festivals across Edinburgh um, by about April May time that it really wasn't going to be possible in the interest of public health and safety to run major live events so we reluctantly and with huge sadness um, shared the news that the Fringe would, wouldn't be able to go ahead as planned in 2020. The impact of that for us was enormous um, and I don't think I don't think everybody always understands just how the Fringe operates. It's not a traditionally curated funded festival in the way that normal arts festivals are. The Fringe is this exceptional thing. It's really special in that, um, as you said in your opening remarks, Susan, it's it's open access and quite literally what that means is that anyone who wants to perform on the stages of the fringe is welcome to perform there there's no restrictions there's no limits if you want to be part of it you pay your registration fee you find your venue your stage to perform on and sometimes that can be a telephone box sometimes it can be in the EICC and one of the major stages there um but it's 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 what's special about it is that it's uh, it's it has that open access platform that everyone is welcome and uh, and I don't curate the fringe no individual um uh, artistic director or, or uh, venue manager programs the fringe it's made up of thousands of moving parts it's made up of entrepreneurs and culturepreneurs and artists and technicians and joiners and the people who make those pop-up venues um, it's it's made up of people from across the city people from across the uk and people from across the world and everybody comes there taking the risk to put on the work and and they 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 sometimes make money they sometimes lose money they sometimes break even um, it's just a mix of absolutely everything possible uh, but everybody is there paying their own way and taking their risk to make it happen and the fringe society as you said the small charity that underpins that is funded by the registration fees that all of the participants pay to be part of it and then a, 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 a small commission on the box office and the tickets sold so it's it's a it's a delicate kind of economic ecosystem. Um, once you take away the ability to uh, have artists register or to to sell tickets for shows, then all of the financial underpinning of the fringe is gone in one fell swoop. And that's literally what happened in 2020. Um, and the Fringe Society, our kind of main, our first objective was at that stage about 2,000 shows had already registered and paid their registration fees. So our position was that we wanted to make sure that um, first and foremost, the artists who make the Fringe, who perform on the stages and make the shows, we're not going to be um, we're not going to be left out of pocket. So we went swiftly to refund all of the artists and companies who had registered to be part of it. 
And in doing so, it left the fringe society facing insolvency. So, and, and uh, as it did with all of the companies and venues that make up the fringe. So we suddenly had this whole ecosystem that is quite literally an endangered species. Um, and I think everyone went into uh, everyone went into survival mode really quickly. Um, the Fringe Society were fortunate in, in securing a loan from Scottish government that enabled us to continue to um, to operate over the last year. Um, I think many of the companies and venues were able to um, glean small amounts of money from some of the recovery funds, and some of them have also taken major loans out as well. Um, so. The, the, we were all heading into 2021 with a view to fantastic, it's going to be up and live again, we're all ready to go. And, um, and of course now the picture is uncertain. So the position that, that we are in is, and that many of our companies and venues are in, is that we are absolutely ready to put on a live festival. But we, we neither have the clarity or the guidance or the understanding of what this virus and this pandemic is going to do um, to be able to say for certain that that can happen. We can say for certain that there will be a fringe in August this year, between the 6th and 30th of August, there will be a festival. Um, but we don't know what that will look like. We're absolutely ready to go into the digital space again. We, we, we um, learned a lot from uh, going into a, a digital fringe last year. Uh, we did so in quite a small and focused way last year. Um, the main objective of that was to make sure that this extraordinary festival stays in the hearts and minds of those audiences who love it, um, the participants who have benefited so much and want to be part of it, and also our kind of international network of fringes across the world and, and friends across the world from arts industry who come to find work here. Um, so we, we, we experimented with digital last year, we learned loads from that and we're absolutely ready to have a digital fringe platform for 2021. We're also ready to provide all of our services to, sort, to support the fringe if it can happen in live in any capacity. And we're also ready to do a hybrid. And that's quite literally the position. I think probably most festivals across the world are in that situation of the minute of, of, of one of those three things, live, digital or hybrid. And that's the that's where we're at right now. But I think, um, you know, I, th I think if we can't, the reality is if we can't put on a, a live event this year, then we really are going to lose some of our companies and venues. They, they, you know, it was hard enough to survive for one year, but to, trying to survive for a second year without some additional support or investment. And I think I would use this platform as a, as a call for recognition of that, that, that these events just don't happen out of nowhere. Um, they need support. And when they happen, they bring such massive economic, social and cultural benefit um, to the city that they're located in. And, uh, and they need some support to be able to come back, especially if, if we're really not looking at a, at a live event happening this year. Um, 2022 is going to be the 75th anniversary of uh, the Edinburgh Fringe, the Edinburgh International Festival and the Film Festival. Um, such a landmark moment. Um, and if these festivals aren't here to be celebrated and, and quite literally re-blossom again, we'll have missed an enormous opportunity. That's my opening remarks. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Shona. Again, you've given us a fantastic insight into um, just all the, 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 the fringe entails and all the interdependencies that are there. And I'm sure we're going to return to that in discussion. Just one comment I would make is that um, it's been so striking in the discussions that have taken place um, over the last year about the impact on arts and culture generally, the number of name checks that Edinburgh gets from people whose whole career started at the fringe is just incredible. And that too is a salutary reminder about just how important the fringe has been and will be again to so, so many people. So thanks again, Shona, and look forward to continuing the discussion in a little while. Okay, I'm going to move on to our third panellist, um, a different type of event again, but something that it is so important and has been so important in the whole 
Edinburgh national events calendar for so many years. So our next speaker is Alan Laidlaw, who is the chief executive of, and to give it his full Sunday name, the Royal Highland Agricultural Society of Scotland. Um, the RHA SS is a charity, its remit is to promote and protect the interests of rural Scotland, but of course it's main event that is best known to, to most of us is the Royal Highland Show, which is Scotland's largest outdoor event and um, which normally would attract um, around 190,000 visitors annually. Probably slightly less well known also is the range of other events that um, Alan through Highland Centre Limited, another arm of the operation, is involved in, which welcomes around 200 events of all different types and sizes throughout the year. Um, Alan, I know, is uh, currently planning for this year's Royal Highland Show um, with all the questions and uncertainties that uh, we've already heard about. But Alan, we'd love to hear more about how you're managing your way through the current situation and what we can look forward to in the future. Alan. Uh, thanks, Susan. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, and um, most of you will know about the Royal Highland Show. It's a common joke that most people of Edinburgh talk about it from a traffic perspective. Um, we're also the home of techno, though. So we are the home in Scotland of techno music, and we hold different types of events all through the year. And um, so, like Shona, like Marshall, you know, the, the news of COVID's impact, it was, was deep, hard. Um, Susan talked about our, our charity. Uh, we are a charity. We, we turn, turn over about 8 million normally. Uh, and last year, that turnover was, was cut by more than 70% because of our events business being effectively put on ice. I think for me, um, you know, the Royal Highland Show is many things to many people. It's a, an opportunity to compete uh, at the highest level, whether it's the dairy or ice cream championships or whether it's livestock breeding and innovation. It's an opportunity to come together uh, and, and share stories. And I think after what we've been through for the last year, that coming together will be particularly important. It's also an opportunity to do business. Um, and the, the, the Royal Highland Show generates around 65 to 70 million for the Scottish economy on, a, on an annual year. The centre sort of generates 250 million. And, and that's for an 8 million pound turnover charity on the edge of Edinburgh. We cannot underestimate the impact of events on, on our economy, um, particularly in Edinburgh. But people often do, and, and we need to make sure that we understand what good looks like. And I think that's the challenge that Shona referred to. We're all facing a, a period of uncertainty. Um, twin tracking or triple tracking planning of scenarios is, is exhausting. Doing that in an environment where I don't know if something has been announced by Scottish government since Susan started speaking 20 minutes ago, and I could be challenged by a questioner to say, well, that's just changed. Um, and that makes, that makes planning really, really tough. Um, so I think Sean is absolutely bang on. Everyone is looking at different models and, and we need to look at making sure that we hit the right timing of our run and we hit the right product. One of the things that's really interesting at the moment is public sentiment. So the Royal Highland Show launched ticket sales in December, planning for a June 2021 show. At that point, we were heroes. Brilliant. Something to look forward to. Can't wait. It's in the diary. Um, come the 10th to the 15th of February, our updates on social media were being met by a public saying, are you trying to kill people by hosting events? Because people were so scared post-Christmas and with new variants and, and, and further lockdown and probably seasonal blues. And that uncertainty translates right into the, the event organisers. And I think that's, that's part of the challenge. And it's part of the challenge for government to give certainty as to what good looks like because we're all going to pillory them if they say you can be a bit, you know, together as a group, as a family, come the first of the X month, but it doesn't happen. But I do think that events are about hope and about um, aspiration and about coming together. And um, you talked, Susan, about um, having a coffee together, the, the sort of serendipitous chat that you get from meeting somebody at an event. If I think about what events are, I, I was a punter. For, until 2016, and the Royal Highland Show was a highlight of my year because I'm an agriculturalist. But if I look at the best events that I've been to, it's the Royal Highland Show, it's the British and Irish Lions, tours in Australia, it's Coldplay down in um, Sunderland, it's watching Black Grouse in Murray Show with my father, or it's a village fete. And, and I think all of those are different experiences, and we, we're in the real danger of this group talking about the big stuff. 
but all of those small community events, and, and Shona made a really good point about the, the sort of launch pad for people. All of these are about people and about opportunity and about, as I say, serendipity of, of coming together. And you don't realize that if we don't have a clear strategy, that disappears. So for example, when tea in the park disappeared, we lost a lot of infrastructure. And that wasn't people and expertise because Jeff Ellis and the sector are still here. We lost hair Spencer. And that means when we bring the Solheim Cup or the Ryder Cup to the Eagles, we don't have enough kit in Scotland to put those events on. Last year, we lost Porta Cabin, and Porta Cabin were at the end of our site at Ingolston. And that's because we use them a lot for our events. Now, without them, our next Porta Cabin operator is in Manchester. So every time we get a Porta Cabin delivered, it's another thousand pounds, and that might be a hundred times a year. So it's these sort of things that if Scotland, if Scotland's um, events industry isn't given the right opportunity for support and, and growth and the right messages, we are in a real problem. And that makes planning nearly impossible. It makes um, confidence very difficult to come by. We have a lot of bookings like Marshall that have, have tracked forward into 21, 22, but many of them would be able to happen without certainty because their funders or their investors will just say enough is enough. And that's where that piece for us is, is really important. Lots of people will probably be saying, well, it's nice to have a year off and it's nice to have a break. I don't think they understand the hole that will be left when they turn around and they look for things to go to and do. You only need to see that Creamfields and other events this week have sold out in record time. There's a huge appetite for people to come together, but it has to be done safely and it has to be done properly. Edinburgh's got problems with events that people complain about them not being done properly. And we need to make sure as venues and organizers that we get that right. You know, you both commented uh, about the ICC. You know, we need to make sure that all of Edinburgh's venues are, are being used properly. We've got 300 acres of space. We can do a lot of events that are really big and noisy and none of the residents will, will be upset. It's about finding the right product for the right place at the right time um, and do that. And I think for me, one of the questions I saw is how do we remain upbeat? We remain upbeat because Edinburgh is at the forefront of the market. It's got huge expertise. It's got huge um, muscle memory to be able to deliver events. But that is wasting. That is wasting at an alarming rate. And when we turn around and we need it and people are feeling confident on events, we need to have those. My normal lead time in for the Royal Highland show is eight months. We've cut it to the bone now and we need certainty about what can happen and what can't happen. Um, and that uncertainty will, will kill us if we don't get it right. So really interested to, to have the panel discussion. Um, I think we have got some great opportunities, but we've got some pretty big challenges as well. Thanks very much indeed, Alan. And again, a terrific summary of, of the issues that you face. And I'm glad that you made the point about the, the potential hole that will be left and all the other infrastructure that is just sort of withering on the vine to some extent at the moment in Scotland and that we won't just be able to turn back on like a tap. Um, I think the other thing that we should never forget in all the work that you're all doing and talking about today is just how as people we benefit, you know, many of us are part of generations of um, school children growing up in more urban environments that lend one end of a cow from the other by trips to the Highland Show and so on. And the, the same is true of all sorts of other exposure to, to events and cultural activities and so on. And that that's leaving a different type of hole, I think, in a, in, um, a whole range of people's lives and the, the development just now. Um, so thanks again for that, Alan. Last but not least, I'm going to come on to Buster House or to give him his, his full Sunday name, Major General Buster House. Um, Buster is the Chief Executive of the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo. Um, he was on the board of the tattoo from 2015, but took up his current post in June 2020, which was an interesting time, um, just after the, the tattoo had been cancelled for the first time in its history. Um, Buster has a tremendously long and accomplished career, uh, largely in the military and the Royal Marines, and that includes his last MOD post, which was as head of the British Defence Staff in the Embassy of Washington, D.C., working with the Obama administration. 
um, Buster um, always speaks his mind and I'm sure he will be no different today. So Buster, over to you. Thank you. Well, a lot of wisdom has been spoken already and I'll try and keep to my five minutes. Um, in my experience in life, misery is easy. It is happiness you have to work at. And um, I think the nub of what we do is that we are dealers in hope and glee and celebration and the human spirit and energy and all the things which help people find purpose and um, identity. It's said that you need identity, purpose and belonging to thrive. And so when Liz in her opening remarks talked about the economy of Edinburgh being so symbiotically connected to festivals and live events, it's not just in terms of, of the finance, finances that are generated, it's a whole psychological mindset. And I don't think that's ever been truer than currently. The genesis of the festivals in Edinburgh, which could have been, there was a debate as to whether they should have been started in Oxford, but you know, the old Riki was fortunate enough to win the competition. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a national, event it's an international event but its genesis as you all know is 50 years ago you know in the first world war more than 70 years ago in the, in the first world war second world war i'll get there eventually um and the circumstances that prevail now are very equivalent i read in the daily telegraph on the 30th of january through these very very difficult perhaps unprecedented times that we were at peak bleak um and you know, I feel really strongly that we somehow need to keep the, 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 the sparks of opportunity and optimism alive in order to, to galvanize everybody else. Um, it's interesting when you, um, when, you, when you look at activities and the whole oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, um, um, consequences of what you do you get equivalent amounts if you take 30 minutes of exercise if you hug somebody for 20 seconds if you sing for five minutes if you dance for three minutes and if you kiss for six seconds so kissing wins uh, but, but i don't deal in kissing i, I deal in music and dance largely and um, those others who have spoken today are also purveyors of this currency. So um, in many respects, you know, we're the sort of underpinning fabric of what recovery will look like. And um, many of my previous speakers have very eloquently explained, you know, how vulnerable that is and the, the time that creativity takes to operationalize and it's months and months. And those in Festivals Edinburgh, and I represent the tattoo, one of only 11 of them, but we have had endless conversations about how we keep those sparks glimmering through these difficulties. And most profoundly, the uncertainty which continues to prevail. And if that uncertainty isn't clarified, then certainly this year, I think live events will, um, will largely disappear again. We started selling tickets in October. So far we've sold 70,000 working on the premise of being socially distanced, um, one meter plus. We've done an immense, immense amount of work to produce a system of safe systems, which can pretty much accommodate any sort of policy guidance we get. Um, what we need is the policy guidance. Um, I think that the, the castle in many respects, more open than most in terms of the esplanade. It's um, at 460 meters above average sea level. It's quite well ventilated. Um, it could be used for much more, uh, particularly this year, but in future than the tattoo. You know, the castle has presided over the safety and well-being of Scotland since the second century. 
as a symbolic um, as a symbolic place. I feel that it will be utilised by as many people as might in in the coming uh, year and season and beyond if we are able, um, because um, events, internal events, inevitably, at least for a bit, may be may be more of a challenge. On the 16th of August, 1977, Elvis Presley died. When he died, there were 540 impersonators. By 2000, there, are two, there were 220,000. If you extrapolate that linearly, by 2050, one in four of us will be in blue suede shoes. Creativity is infectious. It's good for the soul. And whether you're an Elvis impersonator or somebody who sings in the bath, the festivals and creativity is important. And the naysayers of the likes of the, um, um, what's the, what, whether, it's, whether it's from Coburn Street or elsewhere, who persist in thinking that an empty city is the best city, a, a medieval empty theme park, you know, that's not what Edinburgh is about. That is not what Edinburgh is about. Edinburgh is about glee and dynamism and dancing and singing and live events. Thank you. Thanks very much in, indeed, Buster, and you, you didn't disappoint. Um, I don't know about blue suede shoes. I'd just be pleased to get your training shoes at the moment. But uh, uh, you've also reminded us just of all those other things that we get from, from live events and experience and and I guess even kissing can often be a, a, a byproduct of people coming together. Um, and that's just, of course, what we've not been able to do. I think as we go into the discussion now, and can I ask, by the way, all the panelists just to make themselves visible so we, we see you all together. And again, thank you all for <clears throat> just sharing some fantastic thoughts to aid discussion today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let me just take as a jumping off point before we think more about some of these questions of policy and guidance and what's going to be possible in the year ahead. Let's, let's just reflect on that question of Edinburgh and its future. And Buster gave us a bit of a jumping off point there because there have been discussions, lots of discussions and rubbing points um, over recent years about the scale of events in Edinburgh um, and tensions without without question. Now, I have to say, I, to hear, as, as, as I have done, um, some people talk about concerns of over tourism when we've got tumbleweed kind of blowing down the high street, um, feels a bit odd. But nonetheless, and I, I know all of you um, are sensitive to um, some of these questions about how Edinburgh comes back and particularly how we deal with events at scale. And I wonder if, um, Buster, you've, you've already given us a little bit of an insight to your thinking on this, but I wonder from the other panellists if you'd just say a little bit about how you visualise Edinburgh's future and where the activities you're involved in sit as part of that. Shona, would you like to kick that off maybe? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you, you, you know, we're not oblivious to the fact that the fringe has been very much part of that, um, that conversation in the city about over tourism and sustainability and I mean the idea that we're not um, deeply sensitive to that and uh, you know I have an entire team who are also residents of the city I think sometimes it can be forgotten that we're all city residents as well um, and you know I think all of us um, and certainly under the festivals Edinburgh umbrella are absolutely signed up to a sustainability agenda that um, helps to manage our events within the city in a in a safe and forward thinking way and uh, you know for me it's a it's an absolute balance uh, between everything that Buster has just described the extraordinary um, opening up an international connection and perspectives and um, dynamism that festivals and live events bring to a place 
um, balanced with the need of the of the, the city's own people. Um, and I think all of us are absolutely signed up to a sustainability agenda. And some, I mean, there are going to be some positive things that come out of the whole COVID experience as well. I mean, our experiment in the digital platform has meant that last year we were reaching parts of the world that with the best will in the world that the fringe probably couldn't have done before for reasons of either um, cost or geopolitics or reasons why people couldn't travel to Edinburgh and suddenly they're part of the fringe in the digital space. So I think there are, there are enormous positives that we've seen from this experience and there are ways that we have found now for people to engage with the festival without necessarily the need to travel, for example. And I think it's, I think the onus is on, and I, I think Buster was referring to the Coburn Association, <laughs> amongst others, is, it, and the invitation has always been there to work together and um, to manage our events in a way that sit comfortably within the city. And, you know, I think it's, uh, I, I think it shouldn't be forgotten that we had 900 Scottish shows last year um, that are also really availing of that platform um, to, to have their work seen and heard by international audiences and to have their work toured overseas. And for artists, that can mean another five years of life for that work and another five years of income for the artists who make it. Um, so I think I think there's always a balancing act of, uh, of, of and I think the conversation is open to getting it right and I have no interest in in a return to the fringe in 2021 or 2022 and um, where these same arguments are are kind of uh, you know are there and um, I'd much rather be engaged in working with people positively to look at well how can we be part of the solution rather than always being identified as part of the problem. Thanks Shona. Um, Marshall I, I, I mentioned earlier that the, the EICC has <clears throat> now you've got its new mission to create an environment which inspires ideas that change the world. And I'm sure it's no accident that that um, resonates with the whole history of the Enlightenment and so on in Edinburgh. So there's that clear desire there for you to use the ICC and the events that it hosts to really position Edinburgh as a place of ideas. Um, and I wonder if you could just share a bit more of, of your vision uh, on that, please. Well, yeah, to create an environment which inspires ideas that change the world. We, we, um, it's interesting. As as a leadership team, we we went off to think about that for a day and to have a discussion as to why we do events. And it's really easy to articulate what we do. So we procure conferences from and events from all over the world. But but why do we do that? And um, you know, after a lot of debate and discussion, we, we came up with this uh, vision statement. That's now four years ago we did that. Um, I mean, fast forward to present day. I mean, what we are seeing right now is a huge demand. It's a pent up demand for people to connect physically, um, not to just connect online. Um, because having a having a, an event within the EICC or or any other event venue within the city is more than just a, a transferring of information. It's you're there to learn, you're there to to create, and and you're there most importantly to collaborate. Um, I, I think what this what will happen going forward. Um, I think that fundamentally people that that attend events within Edinburgh or anywhere will be much more present throughout their event. I think, you know, sometimes, how many times have we gone into a, a, a function room full of 2,000 people and 20% of them are checking their emails on their, uh, on their desk, uh, which is hugely disrespectful in my opinion. But, but I, I think we'll see less of that going forward. Um, and I think delegates, when they come to the city, will be much more focused on the city itself and why they're there. Um, and I think people will absolutely appreciate it more than perhaps um, that the, the they have in the past. Um, Shona mentioned just there about the sustainability aspect and EICC's measurement criteria has been clear for a number of years now. We measure our success on the social interactions that we have within our local community, which is deeply important to us. Um, 
our environmental impact with uh, what we've developed now, which is called the step change effect, which um, we implemented in uh, 2000, early 2019. And obviously the third section, as far as that's concerned, is that we need to be profitable and we need to be generating economic impact into, into the city. But, but I think there'll be a much more, I mean, there's certainly, I'd, I like to position EICC as a company that has had a good balance of that um, over the years and, and, and long may that continue. And I think what's going to happen going forward is we're going to see much, uh, you know, to start off with, once we get certainty uh, from, from government as to when we can open, um, initially we're going to see more uh, sort of local or as we call national events. And I think we'll see much more people dialing into these events for certainly for the short to medium term. So some of the international delegates, as I say, maybe we got a speaker from uh, the States that historically would have flown over for a day to speak and then flown out again, just is not, that's not practical anymore. And I, I think if you have any social responsibility at all or environmental responsibility, you just won't let that happen and neither you should. Um, but, and I think some of the other speakers um, have said there um, earlier that um, what the industry is crying out for right now is certainty. And hopefully we're going to get that shortly. Thanks, Marshall. And I'm, I'm going to come on in just a moment to that question of certainty or perhaps maybe less uncertainty is a shared ambition at the moment. But just sticking with um, Edinburgh and its future and how we all of us as citizens and local people embrace and recognise and support and applaud the work that all of you do. I was quite struck, Alan, by um, something that, that you said, which is, you know, for a lot of Edinburgh folk, they, they just associate the Highland Show with traffic problems. And it reminded me of, um, and some people involved in today's session will be long enough in the tooth to remember this. It reminded me of when Edinburgh hosted the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting decades ago. And the world's leaders were congregating in our city at the so-called Chogham meeting, as it was. And as Nelson Mandela and his and others motorcades of world leaders went through the city, they passed by all the sandwich boards outside the news agents that had the evening news headline on it, which was city traffic chaos, um, because the streets were closed. And I've carried that with me for about 30 odd years, I think, um, as just an illustration of how we all could and should get better at embracing and applauding and promoting the wonderful world-class events that we have and the wonderful world-leading city that we have. So, Alan, you've, you've got the biggest, as I said earlier, the biggest outdoor event in, in Scotland. What, what more can we do um, and what more would you like to convey to local people or have them to convey to you to support that event coming back in all its glory again, and not just thinking about a few queues in the, the road out of Ingleston. Yeah, um, Susan, I mean, it's, it's, you know, Edinburgh is the home of the Highland Show. 200 years ago, next year, it's the bicentenary of the first Highland Show, which was which was held in, in, the, in the garden of Queensbury House, where, where you would know well from your parliament. Uh, Days and and ultimately we've we've been good at bringing people together. Marshall talked about that being present, you know, being at an event is part of the travel of being there, going to the city, immersing yourself, changing your perspectives. And I used to live um, in Yorkshire and work in the centre of York, and my office was 150 metres from York Minster. And every morning I would come up behind a group of tourists that just got off a bus and they were all stopping to take photos. There was 50 of them blocking a lane that was 12 feet wide. I hated those tourists. I then went to the Minster as a tourist myself and I immersed myself in there. And then I got the majesty that they were seeing the Minster for the first time. And I think many of us will, will come along to something around festival time or the Six Nations or a football match in Edinburgh. And we won't appreciate it because it's not our thing. But if we go and we become part of it, we appreciate the value. And I, I think that's for me. I, I used to um, work in Bell Spray on the Dean Bridge. And whenever I came up into town in August, it was like, oh, it's too busy. But that always changed when I then went to an event and I got into the cadence of, and, and the buzz 
Um, my previous background was in property and I was involved in Regent Street and the redevelopment of Regent Street as an experiential shopping area. And it is a completely different thing about immersing yourself in a city and becoming part of that cadence. And Christmas is a different cadence to February. February is a different cadence to, to August. And, and it's about engaging that. And I think we have we can't underestimate the positive impact of those. Buster's poetic sort of language about you know where we are and dealing in hope. Actually, a, a, a desperately empty city one day becomes a desperately deprived city another. And I think that's the piece that that people you know need to, to work on. So I I think that's that enlightenment piece is really important. We built a new building. We built a, a new multi-use event state space in the heart of Ingolston. We had we were handed the keys by the council the day before lockdown. We literally spent five million pounds in a brand new building to bring the agricultural and the events community together to think differently. And that building's still there. Marshall's building's still there. We have opportunities to 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 give the backdrop to real sort of thinking. And that for me, it's a mindset. And if we're all entrenched that events are good or bad then we will all have a black and white view. And part of the enlightenment is that Scotland should have a black and white view, from my perspective. Thanks very much, Alan. I'm always fond of quoting that great philosopher, Joni Mitchell, in saying that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And I think that's something that we really have to hold on to in Edinburgh. Um, I am looking at the, the chat here, and I'm keen to encourage the more than 100 participants that we have in our virtual room um, to put their questions uh, to the panellists. So please do do that. And if you want to direct your question to a specific panellist, if you can indicate that, then I will direct it accordingly. So while audience members are thinking about their questions, let me um, dive into the, the question that is just inevitably been running right through this discussion so far, which is this whole question of uncertainty and around guidance and what might be doable and permissible in the coming year. Um, it was, I think, very striking to us all that, you know, in, I think it was consecutive days we had what I think most of us here certainly regarded as quite a gung-ho approach coming from the UK government in relation to um, reopening and, of course, many live events and festivals um, south of the border have confirmed their intention to run on the back of that. And again, a characteristically more cautious approach by the First Minister here in Scotland. And I don't think I was alone in being quite surprised when the First Minister kind of sat down at the end of her statement at the end of April, so to speak, um, because I think we were all hoping and looking for some more indication of the direction of travel beyond that. Um, Discussions are ongoing, Alan, as you said earlier, there could have been something announced in the last hour that we've, we've all missed because we've been in this discussion. But I would ask each of you to say what you would really hope for and look for from UK and Scottish government and indeed possibly from the City Council as well, who have got an important role to play in all of this, that would enable you to make a reality of some of you, I think, um, pragmatic ambitions that you have for this year of 21 as part of us building back up for the future. So who'd like to kick off on, on that question? Buster, I thought you might. <laughs> Carry on Buster, I, yep. Can you hear me? I think that, um, you know, one of the key things is to have a clarity of policy which goes across the piece. So we have had um, um, encouraging assurances that you know there won't be local divergence once the national policy is articulated and it will be implemented consistently. I think that that will greatly simplify things. There's an issue then of having sufficient bandwidth to implement it. I think by chance the tattoo is engaging in its first EPOG today, the uh, events uh, planning operations group, which you know, traditionally scrutinizes safety and organization. And is, is, it's not a formality by no means because other risks routinely you know, obtain from traffic management to terrorist threats, but it will, it, it's, will be significantly less complex inevitably than it will be this year. So there's, 
there's a question as to whether there will be enough capacity within the officialdom of, of Edinburgh to manage that. But um, when, it, when it comes to national policy, um, you know, there are all sorts of things that blunt things, which I could say as a Marine, which I'm probably better advised not to. But, um, you know, I have a sense that there will be convergence, whether you thought the Prime Minister's um, policy statement was, you know, quite buccaneering or otherwise, it is based on science. It has built in a series of checks to ensure that the assumptions that are being made you know, are, are correct over five weeks, because I think he recognizes that going into another lockdown psychologically is not an option. And so whatever the politics across the border, which seem to be particularly vexed, um, I think there will be convergence. It will be impossible for Scotland to, to be an outlier. I mean, I, I struggle with the notion of trying to eradicate the pandemic, which seems to be the first minister's declared position, because no other country seems to be thinking that that's a practicality. This is a reality we will live with. There will be a question of what is tolerable as, as the vaccine and the virus battle it out. So, you know, I, I am inherently optimistic and I think that we will get convergence of these two policies in the coming weeks. I think there may be a sort of magical reveal as we come towards the election, if I was being cynical. I worry that the six weeks of obligatory PERDA and the, what the British press has described as a fish fight that's going on between you know, two individuals whose names are identifiable um, will rob bandwidth of decision making. So that, you know, we're going to run out of time, we're going to run out of capacity to get to where we need to go for us to make the judgments and put in place the planning that we need. Thanks very much, Buster. And before I bring in the other panelists, can I just highlight a couple of questions here in the Q&A um, that uh, you might like to comment on? One attendee unnamed says, can I ask the panel's thoughts on reports that the Scottish Government are to introduce a tier system where case numbers will dictate which level you go to and the cases will have to be less than 50 per 100,000 before you can go into level two. I don't know if anyone wants to pick up on the tier system specifically. And um, I think something that we are all aware of here, which is the issues specifically around international travel. Um, again, no name here, but um, main question here is what are the chances for international travel to inverted commas be allowed in May, June, August. If Scotland um, will be able to deliver live events, most likely they will be kept local UK based crowd. Are we preparing for this sort of scenario? So who'd like to pick up on some of these um, questions about what will be doable this summer? Alan, do you like to go next? Yeah, I, I think I can pick up on the tier question. The international question is much better the place panelists. Um, the Golden Shears is the World Sheep Shearing Championships. It was cancelled in New Zealand this week at you know 24 hours notice before it happened because there was one case of, of COVID in Auckland and the New Zealand position was taken. Now, Buster's referred to that sort of eradication of the virus. One of the questions has talked about language. We need to get to the point where people are comfortable taking their own decisions around where travel allows. And, and one of the things we've spoken a lot through the event industry advisory group with Event Scotland is about the language around events. Um, there are you know, demographics that come to events at Ingleston, like our techno events, that are very, very low risk for COVID. You know, they are all probably sub-25, um, and you know, it, COVID is not a big impact for them. And it's about making sure that we, we understand what events look like. For us, you know, that regionality is going to be hugely challenging. So if, for example, Edinburgh went from tier two to tier four, we could have the rest of Scotland in tier two able to travel, but not able to join us here in Edinburgh. And, and that's, that's going to be hugely challenging. Event organizers carry risk all the time, but we need to, it needs to be proportionate uh, and it needs to be realistic. And we need to stop the inflammatory language that events are more dangerous. You know, I dare say as Edinburgh residents, the Meadows is busier than most of our events at Ingleston. And that is unmanaged. 
there's no EPOG, there's no medical, there's no scrutiny of, of, of distancing. Uh, and, you know, if you have a school of 1500 kids in it, you know, that's a, a gathering, that's an event that's happening on a daily basis at the moment. Yet, you know, Marshall's not allowed to have 250 people plus in, in a massive conference space, and we're not allowed to have it 300 acres. So I think the tier thing is understandable, but it's going to be really dangerous um, for, for people making long-term decisions. Thanks, Alan. And Marshall, would you like to come in next and maybe pick up on that question about international travel? And also, and Alan's just touched on this, um, there's a question from um, Kenneth Good saying, I've said from the start of the first lockdown that the biggest problem with it all the, will be the fear factor associated with life over the past year. Um, and he asks, what messages would the panel put forward and what mediums um, would they use to reach out to their audience and clients to reassure them that attending their events and venues is safe to everyone when no guarantees can be provided? Marshall. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a really interesting point. And I call it the fad factor rather than the fear factor because it's full of fear, anxiety and doubt that people have about coming to uh, to attend events. I mean, I think, you know, Alan mentioned there we're not allowed to have people over 250. At the moment, we're not to, allowed to host events more than two people. That's the law. We can't have more than two people in our building attending an event. Having said that, we've already had thousands of students through our events safely because of the, the measures that we've taken. We're now operating safely as a vaccination centre. Um, and because of the, all of the, the new operating models that we've implemented, we've had no, no cases of COVID that have been um, directed to EICC or any. I, I think looking back to the start of this, there was um, one of the hotels in Edinburgh were really unfortunate that they were one of the first places to, um, you know, to record cases of COVID. And we've kind of suffered from that over the last 12 months because it was a, a sort of indoor environment. But, but I, I think we can, we can certainly address the, the fear factor, the fad factor, whatever you want to call it, by saying that we've, we've, we've already had thousands of people through in a, in a very safe manner. I think, you know, just going back to the original point that you made, Susan, about government, you know, UK, Scottish government, I think internationally, I think the lack of collaboration between any government has been astounding. What we've seen over this year has been um, some fantastic collaborations from the world scientific community that has brought together, uh, who have worked together successfully to, in a very short period of time, come up with these vaccines. I think from a government perspective, from a government perspective, and that's not just Scotland uh, and the rest of the UK. I think, you know, from an international perspective, it's been really unfortunate that we've not seen very much or any international collaboration as far as that's concerned. Buster made the point there earlier about the, um, you know, a clarity of policy, and that's absolutely fundamental uh, to, to any sort of reopening of our events. We need clarity of of policy. And, and you may say that some governments have a gung-ho approach towards this. I actually think what events and business generally are crying out for is a plan. And let's, like we've got a strategic plan for the rollout of the vaccination, let's have a strategic plan implemented well and implemented with integrity on the reopening of events and, and, and tourism-related business in general. And I, I think we will have to do, um, we will have to have international events this year because we've got COP in Glasgow that is uh, scheduled to, uh, uh, to go in, um, in October. Um, and I think prior to, well, I know prior to that, we have one of the biggest events we've ever done coming to EICC, which is the, uh, the, the, the TED Summit, which starts just before COP, the week before. And, um, and that event is going to be attended by prime ministers, um, senior politicians from all over the world. You know, 1,200 delegates from over 100 countries are coming this year. So um, I would like to think that um, we would be in a position on the last 
the last certainly the last quarter of this year to to be able to to see some sort of international travel uh, in some shape or form. And I may be being optimistic on that, but that's certainly what we are planning for. Shona, um, you're obviously having to deal with these issues by the day. Um, and, you know, I'd be interested in your comments in any of the strands of discussion of questions, but um, particularly maybe that question around whether we're anticipating this to be a more local um, activity this year, albeit that, as Marshall says, you know, hopes would be that international travel will start to build back up. Um, and there's also a specific question for you here, Shona, which is um, from um, Paul, who's asked, um, should we still sign up as new venues for the Fringe this year? Is that possible? So, you know, there's so many people now are absolutely in that space of what will might be doable this year and what can we go ahead and plan? Um, so what's your thoughts and what's in your mind just now? Um, well, to take Paul's question very specifically, um, oh, that I could give Paul a very specific answer to that question about whether he should sign up as a venue or not. And I think I think all of my colleagues here have already touched on it, the need for clarity. Um, clarity is, is clarity we can work with, but this limbo that we find ourselves in at the moment means that we can't give answers to people like Paul, um, you know, the third party people who are part of our events. And, you know, I, I'm not here to kind of to, to bash any government or, 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 you know, to bash any decision. I think this must be the most impossible time to try to be a politician and to listen to all of the science, but also listen to all of your stakeholders and try to come up with the right answers. Um, it's enormously challenging times, um, but, for for us and for the part that we can play in the recovery um i think just some level of um actually making us part of the solution uh, in the way that the eicc has been in the rollout of the vaccine you know i i think we've got to be trusted with clear guidance that we can run our events safely and i absolutely believe that we can uh, but we need to have a real clear outline of what are the public health and safety measures none of us want to put anybody at risk it would ruin our businesses to put anybody at risk and um, so if we had clear guidance about what uh, you know what we need to put in place in order to keep the public safe at the moment we don't know is it two meters is it one meter is it one meter plus is it masks is it sanitizing you know sanitizing is it test centers all of these we can put in place if we just get the clear guidance that that's what's needed. Um, and, and to me, I would just I would just love to get to that point with regard to international travel. Sometimes I think the festivals get caught in this kind of catch all mix. We forget that, that Edinburgh is a medieval city with a castle, um, which is the thing that attracts most visitors from all over the world <laughs> to come see it every year. And it attracts them during the summer months because, uh, yo, it's cool to the rest of the year in, in Edinburgh and Scotland. So there's a kind of perfect storm, I suppose, that happens every summer. and. Um, you know, the reality is that the international audience for the fringe is seven, eight percent. Um, so can we operate with a, a local audience? Can we operate if there's if there's not huge amounts of travel this year? Yes, of course we can, because we have a, a largely uh, our audience is largely Edinburgh, Scotland and UK based in any case. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, actually, the real big issue in that is um, is I want to be able to see artists from all over the world perform on our stages. Um, it's less actually for me about international audiences and much more about um, our access to stories from all around the world. And whilst digital has been a good stopgap, I am desperate to see performers and artists and companies back in this city sharing their cultural um, identity and their stories of their places in a live way with live audiences. Susan, could I just make a brief comment directly to the gentleman who talked about safety and reassurance? Um, I was a soldier for 34 years and one of the sayings in that particular trade is that it's the nitpickers that survive and I've been to war seven times and I'm still standing. Um, and I think the devil lies in the detail of this. 
Um, and I think I could probably speak to, for all my colleagues to, when I say that there is an immense amount of thought going into how we manage these spaces. There are three components to the, all live events. There's the audience, there's the staff who manage it, and then there's the performers. And um, we've taken, obviously, we've, we've horizon scanned all best practice from every single quarter. We've looked at sage advice. We've bought in medical expertise. Um, you know, there's one thing to bubble up a team of 11. There's another thing to bubble up a cast of a thousand for a month. But we've figured it out. And, and so we have produced a system of safe systems and when the actual architecture of the policy that we need to conform to is clarified, we will then identify the bits that are required in order to meet that. It's a moving, it's a moving challenge. But you know, when we started looking at how we mitigated this extraordinarily contagious thing, it was very mechanical. We were thinking about putting sort of porter cabins to control access through which people's temperatures would be taken. It was all quite sort of physical and clunky and managing flows. You know, we're doing work with Edinburgh, Edinburgh University to understand the sort of fluid dynamics of transportation and movement around the city. But um, increasingly it's become more, we're trying to get left of the bang. We're trying to track you know, your QR code when you buy your ticket to your, if it's a vaccination passport, whatever the sort of electronic technology, there are apps now which can help people move around the city and at range know when to leave home most safely. They can see what restaurants are least populated. You know, you can, there's a huge amount of technology and opportunity and innovation which is going into mitigating these things. Now, it's up to us to tell that story. And we will have, you know, um, 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 Miss McCarthy um, um, or a, a, a anime version of her sort of walking through our experience into the castle, you know, a second century building designed to keep people out. So, you know, we've got to think carefully about those flows. So if, if you want to know what it will be like to come to the tattoo, then we will have something on our website which explains in eye-watering detail. So you know exactly what the experience will be and how we will keep you safe. I've often heard it said that uh, with all the military expertise that exists in and around the tattoo, then you couldn't be better placed for, for being able to plan major events safely. Now, I'm conscious that we've only got a few minutes left. I can't, I don't know where the time's gone. And what I'd like to do is just read out a few more comments and questions from the Q&A and take a last round of comments from each of the speakers. And I'm just going to allow you the choice of which of these questions and comments you might like to say something about. We've had a few questions, again, around how the event sector and events are could be better recognised um, within policy. Joe Goldblatt, known I'm sure to many here, an expert in events in his own right, um, very active in chamber events and discussions, has asked, how do each of you stay hopeful, motivated and positive about live events in our country um, when in the recent government strategic framework announcement, your sector wasn't even mentioned? And Joe has also, um, asked what lessons have, have you learned about the need to better position the Edinburgh events industry before key decision makers such as Scottish Government to ensure that live events are prioritised in terms of recovery in the future and I think that links also if I can find it um, to a question from an anonymous attendee which is directed to the panel but I think could be directed equally to the audience um, which is as event professionals how can we play our part in highlighting the importance of the events industry to Edinburgh? It's great to see leaders talk about the subject, but how do we make our voices heard to amplify the conversation? Um, Heidi has asked about how you feel about the fact that festivals have been allowed to run in England um, this summer, no clarification yet here in Scotland. And a very specific message from Heidi to Alan saying, I'm a techno fan 
So hoping that V and the 90s ultimate rave will go ahead in the autumn. I'll leave it there. Um, and also a couple of comments and questions here that, um, and I know many of you touched on this already, about the future of live events and that balance between physical and digital and where you think that might settle. So I'm going to give all four of you one final brief bite at the cherry or any bit of it that you want to show off um, and just indicate who'd like to kick off. Alan. Um, I'll, I'll go, Susan. Um, yeah, I, I think we need confidence and we need to be agile. Um, clarity about England versus Scotland will, will come in due course uh, and, and we will cope with it. I agree with, with Heidi. I think we want, to, we want to have all types of events happening in Edinburgh. And I think, how do, we, how do we show the value to event professionals? One of my most active team members on social media is our, our um, site coordinator. And on LinkedIn, she is always using the hashtag we make events and she's making it from a really operational level and she's telling everybody who will listen how proud she is to be in the event sector. And whether that's putting on Terminal B as a techno event or um, you know, leading Edinburgh's other vaccine centre um, at, at um, Ingolston. And I, I, you know, that, that wider understanding that there's a huge iceberg and, and literally we are the, the top snowflakes on the top of the iceberg in terms of scale and impact. You know, the thousands of businesses that are involved um, in, in events have to talk about it. And they have to say, um, you know, the economic impact of that. You know, we've got hotels at Ingolston that are only there because of events and airports. And without using them, the, you know, they're going to die. And so I think be proud, be bold, be confident to talk about events. And even if, you know, 10% of your business's events talk about it. And I think finally, the piece for me on hybrid events is um, somebody saying, is now the right time to invest? We as a charity lost two and a half million quid last year. It's very difficult to give a charity trustee a reason to invest a lot of money in a new technology with uncertainty. So trying to be bold and counter cyclical is easy to talk about, but when you've got a financial duty to an organization, that, that's hugely challenging. And that's where language about confidence of the, the, the quality of event organizers is really important. Thanks, Alan. Shona, your closing few thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll hit the digital one first. I mean, that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're planning for a hybrid. We've, we have invested in digital technology. We can absolutely see the legacy piece coming out of this and the opportunity of it to, to reach across the world in a way that we haven't done before. Um, so, so that's happening. And I think that I think our sector is probably one of the most creative sectors to respond to challenge. And so, of course, we will come up with creative responses and we'll use whatever's open to us. But I'm still going to come back to this point, and, and Alan's already made it there as well. Events are, part, are going to be part of the recovery. Cultural activity, engagement, coming together as audiences, as human beings to experience joy and wonder and challenge. All of those things that you only see on our stages and, and through our artists and our creative people, they're going to be a massive part of recovery. We've seen this before. It's why the Edinburgh Festival was set up in the first place, to help Europe emerge out of the horrors of the Second World War. It's why cities of culture titles are, go, are, are given to cities like Glasgow and Derry and Liverpool to enable them to emerge from hard times um, and to, to blossom and to flower. And, it, it's not going to be any different coming out of COVID. Everybody's going to look to our sector as part of the recovery. You can be damn sure that some of those people and those businesses who were complaining about how overpopulated the city was and how hard it was to get to work and everything else are going to be crying out for us to get back into the city centre and, and activate and, and, and encourage people back in. And of course we want to do that and we want to be part of that. But I think we also need the recognition that particularly if 2021 is going to be limited um, and, and possibly not live, that then we're going to need support. We're seriously going to need support to be back and back at our best in 2022. And given the global position of Edinburgh in the world, um, the risk and what we have to lose cannot be overstated. It's absolutely enormous. We, we have a cultural capital. We have a festival city. We have a city that is recognised 
all over the world as being exceptional in, in this arena. And we all want to be part of making sure it continues to be. Thank you. I'm going to allow one sentence from Buster and Marshall, or I'm going to be in big trouble for allowing this event to overrun. Um, but a parting, uh, parting thought, Buster? You're on mute, Buster. My parting thought was a mute one. Um, <laughs> I think there's a balance between um, governmental diktat and individual judgment. Ibsen said there's a certain risk in being alive, and if you're more alive, there's more risk. And at some point, people have to be able to decide. And, you know, the difference between a risk and a gamble is very clear. And, and I think we need to, to, to cede that judgment back to people at some stage so that with the right understanding they can live their lives and you know what we offer is really key to that okay. and to pick up on one of Shona's points you know the momentum of Edinburgh is draining away you know we we have a world-class heritage and position in terms of culture but you know Creativity is 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 ephemeral, and, and the, we will lose that. We will lose that momentum. It's something that the vice chancellor speaks really compellingly about the whole sort of symbiotic cultural energy, and and you know that's a balance. That's a balance. My parting thought. Thanks, Buster. Marshall, your last sentence. Well, Susan, I don't want to get you into trouble, but um, I think it's all been said, really. Um, for me, I just would like everybody to deal with this uh, fear factor. We have, like many, many venues throughout the city of Edinburgh, have spent significant amounts of money ensuring that our audience, our staff, and our performers or our meeting staff are all safe. We have, um, we, you know, we, we've, we, our operating plan has been passed by SAGE, the World Health Organization, and Scottish Government. So, um, that is a big thing. I think just to deal with very quickly the, the hybrid uh, scenario, that's going to be around for a while, no doubt about it. Um, we've got a fantastic platform, Make It Edinburgh Live, which is massively popular. 18 events we did last year on that. And, and I think going forward, we're going to see less hybrid, God willing, and more, um, more live events. Thanks ever so much, Marshall. And, you know, this discussion could go on for another hour, another day. But I hope from all of this today and to everybody in the audience, you've just all heard from our fantastic speakers just how much there is to lose, but also how much there is to build on to really take Edinburgh um, back, or forward into a new future. And as part of that, that future that we all want to look forward to now, um, I want to hand all over just for, for a few words now to our sponsors for today, um, because we're very, very reliant on sponsors to support events at the moment. So Hee Haw and Your GB have both kindly sponsored this event. And Jilly Bain, um, the uh, director of Your GB, is just going to say a few words and then I'll just close off the event. So Jilly, over to you. Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much, Shona. Um, as Shona said, my name is Jilly Bain and I am the director of URGB Events, who were founded in Edinburgh in 2011. And we're a collective of um, marketeers that specialised, I feel uh, terrible saying that in past tense, specialised in live and <laughs> in-person events. And of course now are doing a lot of um, online and we also do event social media, event PR, and the, the important piece at the moment, given that we're so digitally led, is content creation. As uh, Shona said, we are sponsoring today's event and we're delighted to do so in partnership with our great business friends, Hee Haw, who are communication and video specialists. Um, so I am speaking on behalf of uh, both of us today. First off, um, uh, Shona, thank you so much for um, chairing today. Uh, Susan, sorry, thank you so much for chairing today. It's been absolutely um fascinating and just from an events perspective and from you know being a, an events company it's amazing to hear the insights coming from uh, the leaders in our in our field um marshall the 
that your 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 story, your pivot story in terms of how the EICC has turned um, turned the corner in the face of COVID has been inspirational to listen to. And I'm I'm happy to hear your positivity around international travel towards the end of the year. Um, we're of the same mindset and we're planning for the same route too. So I, that was great. That was great to hear. Um, Shona, uh, hearing loud and clear, you know, be it uh, fully digitally or hybrid or, you know, in, if, it, if it's possible in real life, the, the Edinburgh Fringe is going ahead this year. It's happening. And that, that is absolutely, um, it, it, fill, it fills my heart with joy to, to hear that. And equally, extremely excited about the anniversary, the 75th anniversary taking place um, next year. Alan, uh, very interested to hear about the sort of transition in terms of sentiment from hero to villain. Uh, I, I could definitely empathize with what you were saying there. And especially when you were talking about that supply chain piece relevant specifically to um, Porter Cabin in terms of how our ecosystem all survives in terms of suppliers and keeping um, uh, the brains here and not allowing a brain drain uh, to go elsewhere is, is absolutely key to our um, comeback plan. Um, uh, Buster, uh, what you said about uh, misery is easy and uh, it's happiness that you have to work for. Um, absolutely couldn't agree with that more and I think that uh, I, that shows us what we are as humans that work in this industry we do it because we are passionate about it and actually a huge part of this fight uh, to pivot and come back is based on um, our the happiness that we get from the work that we do and therefore it, it is very much worth working for. Um, I think uh, you know I just want to say that uh, um, generally speaking Hiho and your GB are absolutely huge supporters of the Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce. Liz and to all the team, thank you so much for today. Um, and I think most importantly, we're, we're very proud to be part of the, the wider Edinburgh business community. And I think um, today's uh, pulled that into place for me in terms of having a sense of place and being part of a community and not feeling you know, on your own in this mission against um, the, the beast that is, that is COVID. A lot of what's been said uh, has been extremely close to my own heart, having a company where, you know, 90, 80, 90% of my uh, turnover was based on conceptually creating and delivering um, live and in-person events. And we hit the COVID roller coaster hard and we had to attack it with, uh, you know, a tenacious fight. And although you know, we are somewhat bruised by the process, we have, whilst utilizing the support that's out there, managed to negotiate our way through it. And we find ourselves in a place where we've now uh, become online event specialists that are, you know, that we're busy and we're, we are genuinely passionate about what can be done in the world of online events and what, um, what the possibilities are in terms of making them uh, truly uh, immersive and meaningful experiences. Um, to us, to Hee and URGB, I think Edinburgh represents who we are as, as people and as companies. We are, you know, resilient, innovative, innovative and collaborative. We are endlessly, endlessly creative. And I think it's testament to the, the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit that Edinburgh has that, that we're seeing, you know, new businesses coming through, startups that are uh, thriving, um, pre-existing businesses, um, pivoting and you know finding a way and turning a corner and I think you know in terms of the the live events and um, when I was speaking to Mali and the team at Hee Haw prior, prior to this we, we genuinely believe it, it is our live events um, that put Edinburgh on the map globally um, in terms of who we are and and what we do and it's the essence of us, isn't it? You know, have you have you experienced Edinburgh truly if you've not been to the tattoo? Have you experienced it truly if you've not been to the fringe? Do you, if you've not danced in the um, Cromdale at the EICC? If you've not guessed the weight of the um, bull at the Royal Highland Show? Have you experienced Edinburgh? Because if you haven't done those things, you probably haven't. That you know, to, to us, uh, live events inspire people, and they they genuinely have the ability to change lives. And it, it, it ekes back to who, who we are as human beings. Um, it, it's, 
online is great and we are figuring it out and we are we are we are breaking boundaries and hybrids are on are massively on the agenda and we are excited about that medium and what it has to offer and also that legacy piece in terms of the inclusivity that it's providing us with keeping in touch with people that we might not have been able to and um, just being specifically uh, a live event and um, but we 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 need the live events to come back because they they are part of of who we are as uh, as as an industry and who we are as um as as human beings so to speak so yeah it, it's been absolutely amazing hearing everybody talk about their journeys and plans for the future and um Keyhole and UGB are absolutely dedicated to helping our event industry come back and and flourish and that's why we're here today it's why we're supporting so just a massive uh, heartfelt thank you to all of you for your time and for sharing your stories it's been um, really inspirational can't thank you enough thanks so much Julie and that ends the session for uh, today I hope you all have a fantastic rest of the day a fantastic rest of the business festival and I hope that we can all be part of that team effort to bring back Edinburgh's live events and I so look forward to seeing lots of you at one of these live events sometime soon. So thanks to all of you for taking part and particularly for our fantastic speakers. Have a good day. <laughs>